Well, welcome again to Fresh Vision Church. Another week here. Um, the Lord has, I hope that the Lord has blessed you all this this last week and will continue to bless, bless you as this uh, new week starts. If you're watching, listening, thank you for for checking us out. If you have any questions about us, our church, um, what we believe in, our uh, statement of faith, our doctrine of beliefs, all that stuff, it's on our website. If there's anything that isn't there that you need to know more about, feel free to contact me on our website's homepage. If you scroll all the way to the bottom, you'll see a like a prayer request contact form. You can fill that out and I'll get it. I'll, it'll be emailed to me and I'll respond to you as soon as possible. Also on our website, we also uh, have our COVID requirements, all our, well, basically our guidelines, what we decided to set up, set up for now. If you have, again, comments, questions, concerns, anything you, anything at all, you can ask us, ask me on the, the various social media pages we have. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave a comment in the bottom of the video. And also, if you're watching this on Facebook, you can also um, leave a comment there on uh, the comment section. I hope that everyone is doing well, and I hope that after we're done here today that you will have been blessed. So today we're going to be beginning Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, and I've titled this morning's message, Trapping the Trappers. As we begin uh, this chapter, we have to keep in mind that Jesus had already told the Twelve to expect conflict and suffering when they arrived at the Holy City. Back in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, he told them, It is necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed, and be raised on the third day. So Jesus was fully aware of what was coming, and yet he wasn't afraid. Well, in this chapter, we'll be meeting three groups of religious leaders and witness their conflict with Jesus. Now, why a conflict? Why were they having this, these issues with him? Well, they were angered and embarrassed because of what he had done in the temple and for calling them out as thieves. Now they wanted to challenge him. So here they will try to catch him in his words so they can trump up some charge against him, against him and have him arrested as an enemy of the state. Now, in many ways, the gospel stories have one point. And that point is, who is Jesus? This becomes especially clear as the narrative comes to its climax in the last days of Jesus' life. Crowds, disciples, religious opponents, and even Jesus himself seems absorbed in the question, who is he? Well, here in this chapter, chapter 20, zeroes in on this question as Luke begins to reveal the glory of the Christ. So within the next few weeks, this is what we're going to be looking at here. So before we get into the Word of God, let's ask Him to speak to us this morning. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are thankful that You have us here, Lord. I'm thankful for those who are watching and listening. I pray that um, that if there's anyone out there that uh, needs to know You, Lord, that is seeking to to know more about you, to, to be saved, Lord. I pray that you will speak to them mightily, Lord. If there's anyone hurting, anyone that's confused, anyone that's seeking answers, Lord, I pray that, they, that you will speak again mightily here through this message and that you will reveal truths to them that, that they may have never heard before or that they needed to hear, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, 
Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, verse 1. And the word of God says, One day he was teaching the people in the temple and proclaiming the good news. The chief priests and the scribes with the elders came and said to him, Tell us, by what authority are you doing these things? Who is it who gave you this authority? He answered them, I will also ask you a question. Tell me, was the Baptist was the baptism of John from, from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves. If we say from heaven, he will say, why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, all the people will stone us because they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know its origin. And Jesus said, said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Here we see these group of religious men challenge our Lord's authority. At the end of the previous chapter, we learned that after clearing the temple, Jesus spent much of his time in the temple. There he was no longer, he no longer confined his teaching to just his disciples. Now he openly taught the people who gathered to listen. His teaching had one central thrust, the good news of the kingdom. The uniqueness of his teaching style and method had always been evident. Back in chapter 4, when he first entered Capernaum, the people were amazed at his teaching because of its authority. In that same chapter, his authority extended to the power to exercise demons, and in chapter 5, to forgive sins. Furthermore, chapter 10 showed us that it was an authority that he also shared with the disciples. For this reason, the same men that opposed him and were looking for a way to kill him now wanted to know what authority he had and who gave it to him. The scribes had authority. They had studied with the rabbis. They had all the qualifications they needed to be, they needed to be qualified public teachers of the law. The priests had authority. They had inherited the position of priest all the way back to their forefathers, Aaron and Levi. The elders had authority. Their age and experience had gained them leadership in the social and economic affairs of the community. These three groups of Jewish leaders knew that Jesus had no formal training with the rabbis, no priestly lineage, and no experience of the elders. So how dare he dump or how dare he usurp their position and contradict their teachings? The question was, could these Jewish authorities expose Jesus' lack of credentials and rob him of the authority that everyone recognized in his teaching? Well, Jesus answered back by asking a question of his own. If they answered correctly, he would tell them what they wanted to know. And the question was this, was the baptism of John from heaven or of human origin? Well, Jesus had caught them again, and now they were the trappers that had been trapped. If they were to acknowledge that, Jesus, that John's authority was from heaven, then why didn't, why didn't they believe him? Why didn't they believe him as a prophet and obey his message by repenting and receiving the Messiah he promised, he proclaimed? But if they said that John was just another professional teacher or preacher, they would stir up anger of the masses who acknowledged, who believed that John was a prophet of God. So 
the best way these experts in religious knowledge, the best way for them to get out of this pickle was to claim ignorance. They answered that they did not know. This response showed that they really weren't sincere seekers of truth. See, it was more important for them to win an argument against Jesus than in knowing truth. This reminds me of what it says in Job 11, verse 12. A stupid person will gain understanding as soon as a wild donkey is born a human. Keep this in mind. When sharing the gospel with others, it's a fruitless endeavor to convince someone of truth when all they want to do is win an argument. And vice versa. If your goal as a believer, as a Christian, to win an argument, then all you're really doing is cheapening the gospel with your selfish pride. By wanting, instead of presenting the gospel in love, presenting the gospel in truth, you're trying to win an argument. You're putting yourself, you're making yourself more important, your win in that argument, more important than, than really the, the message behind the gospel. If, if you see that a discussion about Jesus is going nowhere, there's just, you know, you both you're getting frustrated, that person's getting frustrated, and, you know, it's not really going anywhere. It's okay to surrender it to the Lord and have Him deal with it. Keep in mind what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. What then, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has a role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives growth. So you see, God does all the work. You're just an instrument of the work that he's doing. So when you plant seeds, when you're having these discussions, when you're, having, when you're sharing the gospel, don't go out there trying to win and argue, trying to prove your point. Just remember to do it lovingly. Do it humbly and do it joyfully. Because by doing it this way, God gets all the glory and you receive a blessing. Well, since they weren't able to answer Jesus' question, he then tells them in verse 8 that he wasn't going to tell them by what authority he was doing these things. The way the Lord saw it, even if they did think that John's baptism was from heaven, they still refused to submit to the message that he was preaching. So now that someone greater than John was among them, he knew they weren't going to accept his answer. They weren't even going to accept his message. Why? Because their hearts were not prepared to receive it. Now, this passage here shows us a couple of things. First, it shows us the great essential in, God's, in, in teaching God's word is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. When, the Holy, when a person is filled with God's Spirit, it can triumph over those whose power is wrapped, are wrapped in degrees, human titles, and honors. So the questions that come up like, where did you get your diploma? Where, who ordained you? What kind of, who, who were your teachers? Who were your trainers? Like who, all that isn't as important as the question, do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? There are so many seminary students roaming the halls of some of the most prestigious and well-known Christian universities that 
that many of them haven't even been born again. They're just there to earn a title and to maybe move up in their denomination and to get to this, this, this title. But they haven't yet been born again. But I tell you this, I bet you that there are more men in prison that are more qualified than those students because they're born again, because they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31, Paul said this, Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant, what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, so that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ, who became wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that, that it's, if you have a calling, a desire to go to Bible college, to go to a seminary, I, 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 I encourage it. Go for it. But it should be to draw closer to God. You're, you should already be going in there as a born-again believer, as a Christian, as knowing what Christ did on the cross for you. And I tell you what, when you go through your studies, everything will have so much more deeper meaning. You'll just love what you're learning. And I know that's what happened to me. You know, I didn't go to Bible college because, you know, I wanted a title or because I wanted to, you know, put a notch on my, on my belt that I did this or I did that. No, I just, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to draw near. I wanted to understand history, and I wanted to understand how we, how the Bible came together, and you know, just these things. And they fascinated. These things fascinate. Even studying, you know, uh, certain books in the Bible, and 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 doing word studies, and you know, the only com- the only complicated thing for me was the only thing I kind of didn't like was doing the math and doing the the science, the required courses. But when it came to the biblical courses, Man, I had, I just soaked it all in. It was amazing. But if that's what you want, if that's your calling, you know, that's what the Lord's calling you to do, then go for it. Do it. You know, but do it as a believer, as a born again believer. A second, it shows us that if we want answers from from Jesus, we must deal rightly with the truth that has already been revealed. These men knew that John said Jesus was the Messiah and were not willing to accept it. Similarly, there are a lot of people out there who, who've known that Jesus or who know that Jesus is the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world but aren't willing to accept it. Why? Because they know that by accepting Christ, It's going to mean surrendering all. And sadly, they'd rather forfeit eternity with God and to forfeit their temporal idols. Now, many of you have been looking for Jesus to answer some serious question that you have. Maybe some of you have been day in, day out, several months, maybe even several years, you've been asking the Lord the same question over and over and over again. And you're just waiting. You've just been waiting for an answer. But have you ever considered that he already has, that he already has answered that question, and what you're really looking for is just another answer? Maybe your question is, Lord, how do I 
get away or how do I get out of this addiction from pornography, from drugs, from shopping? Or how, do I, how do I love my spouse more? How do I love my children more? How, do I, how can I go into work with a more joyful attitude? How can I come into church, you know, when, when my life is, is, is a mess? I think that the Lord has, for many of you, He's already given you the answer. We can examine what the Lord is telling you, and what He tells you is for your own good. He's trying to reveal these truths to you. He's trying to speak to you personally. He's trying to draw you nearer to Him. And he wants to make you more into the make you more into the image of his son. So if you have those answers, then just follow them. Follow what he's telling you. Well, so now that Jesus had turned things around and put these leaders on the defense on the defensive. The Lord then gives them a parable. So let's go to verse 9 and read about that now. Luke chapter 20, verse 9. Now he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard, leased it to tenant farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the farmers so they might give him some fruit from the vineyard. But the farmers beat him up and sent him away empty-handed. He sent yet another servant, but they beat that one too, treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent yet a third, but they wounded this one too and threw him out. When the owner of the vineyard said, What should I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenant farmers saw him, they discussed it among themselves and said, This is the heir. Let's kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to, these, to them? He will come and kill those farmers and give the vineyard to others. But when they heard this, they said, That must never happen. But he looked at them and said, then what is the meaning of this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will shatter him. Then the scribes and the chief priest look for a way to get their hands on him that very hour, because they knew he had, he had told this parable against them. But they feared the people. Now it's important to be clear. I need to say this before I break down this passage. That this parable of the vineyard owner is not about the church replacing the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. There are many denominations, many churches out there who will say that it's basically called replacement theology. They've said they believe that the, the Jews are no longer God's chosen people and that, that the church is, has now replaced, that everything spoken of in the Bible, speaking of, of Israel and the Jews, is, is now speaking of us. Well, this isn't the case here. It's really about the leaders rejecting Jesus as the Messiah and the resulting punishment. The parable was based on the practice of absentee landlords letting hired people till their land for a commission or a portion of the profits. Here, Jesus described an unexpected reversal. The tenants revolted and mistreated the landlord's messengers, refusing to pay the owner's share of the income. Now here, this picture's Israel's history with God's prophets. He sent them and they killed them and they killed them. The prophetic message in Scripture, they so 
ardently taught and argued over had its foundation in people who died in the hands of these leaders as forefathers. Well, the owner had a, had a plan B. He sent his only son, his son, the one that he loved, having no respect for messenger slaves. Surely the tenants would respect the son who carried all the authority of the father. But here, the real meaning of the parable shines through. Jesus is the beloved son. He is the least of the prophets and more. Would this generation treat Jesus any better than their ancestors treated the prophets? However, what we see in verses 14 and 15 was there was no respect at all for the son. The tenants saw a perfect opportunity to grab authority, power, and wealth for themselves. Knowing the law allowed tenants on the land for a minimum of three years to claim property, at the death of a sonless landlord. The decision seemed simple. Kill the son, take over the property. So they did. Well, now plan C. What will the landlord do to these murderous tenants? They had omitted one small detail from their plan, though. The landlord remained alive. Plan C meant that the landlord would come himself with proper backup. He would seize the evil tenants and kill them. Then he would find other tenants who would take care of the vineyard and pay him his share of the profits. Well, the religious leaders were clever enough, were clever enough teachers and students of history to realize what Jesus meant. They were the evil tenants. They face God's punishment for shamefully treating the prophets and for their plans to kill the son. They used a curse formula to express their reaction. This must never happen. Do not upset our our secure and comfortable religious apple cart. In verse 17, Jesus subtly continued the battle of authority. He took the authority they held dearest, the scriptures, and he quoted to them Psalm 118, verse 22. He used their methods of interpretation to push back the to push the psalm back on them. The cornerstone or the foundation stone was a place at the corner of, of the building. It bore the weight of two walls that intersected at the corner. It could be said that it held up the building. Well, Israel's leaders were supposed to be the builders of God's kingdom, equipping God's people to carry out his mission. He sent his son to them, but they rejected him. They killed him. Now, what would happen? God would take Christ, the one they rejected and killed, and establish a whole new building on him. God's vineyard would no longer be in the hands of authorities who were trained by rabbis or authorities based on their racial or priestly heredity, or authorities based on leadership experience among the Jews. The new authority would be directly from God through his son, Jesus. On Jesus, he would raise the walls of the church. The temple would be destroyed. Gentiles would become part of God's people built on Christ. Jesus then changed changed the stone image a bit in verse 18. The stone changes from being a support system for a a, a support system for a building to being a freestanding stone against which you may smash something or under which you may crush something. Either way, though, it remains an instrument of destruction. Christ thus carries two identities here. 
The first is that he is the cornerstone, cornerstone on which the entire weight of the church rests. And secondly, he's the millstone on which Israel's corrupt religious leaders and religion will be destroyed. This section then ends by telling us that the religious leaders now look for a way to get their hands on him, and they wanted to do it immediately, within the hour. But a barrier still remained. To arrest Jesus was to incite the crowd into a rebellious mob. What was right didn't matter anymore. Only two criteria determined their actions. What preserved their authority and what preserved their power base with the people. In this parable, Jesus illustrated the insidious nature of sin. The more we sin, the worse it becomes. As we just saw Jesus liken the prophets to a series of servants sent to collect fruit from the vineyard, but each was beaten or killed. In this, Jesus was saying, I know your plan. I know your intention. I know what's going on in your hearts. I believe he didn't say this to indict them, but to plead with them. Is there any of you who want to change your mind, to change your direction, to repent? That's exactly what the Lord does with us. None of us fall, none of us falls into sin, but rather we walk into sin one step at a time. Yet, as his servants, in this parable and his prophets in the Old Testament, the Lord is faithful to send messengers and warnings to us. All too often, however, we continue on a path of progressive destruction. In the parable before us, the messenger, the first messenger was beaten. The second messenger was not only beaten, but he was also treated shamefully. The third messenger was permanently wounded, and the fourth, a son, was killed. The same progression is seen in the actions of Jewish leaders. They allowed John the Baptist to be killed. They demanded Jesus be killed. And they themselves killed Stephen. That's the way sin is. It progresses. At first, we might be passively allowing it to take place around us. Next, we're requesting, we're requesting that it happen. And finally, we're participating and making it happen. Yet all the while, the Lord faithfully gives opportunities to change directions. We go to a Bible study and get convicted. We turn on the radio or the internet or a message on YouTube or whatever other you know, Christian radio station and hear the words of warning or maybe a concerned brother or sister comes up to you and says, what are you doing? What's wrong with you? Turn back, turn away before it's too late, before that sin swallows you up and you find yourself drowning. Each one, whether it's on the internet, whether it's on the radio, whether it's a friend, a family member, even a child, each one is a messenger sent to save us. The lesson here is this. It's a serious thing to reject the message of God and the messengers of God. Now in the last section that we're going to be covering, that we're about to read, the conflict continued with questions from that were designed to trap him in a contradiction or to get him to say something that would 
diminish his popularity. So let's read about that. Well, again, if you're, let's read about that. And so if you have your Bibles again open, and we're going to read this last section here in verse 20. Luke chapter 20, verse 20. They watched closely and sent spies who pretended to be righteous so that they could catch him in what he said to hand him over to the governor's rule and authority. They questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly and you don't show partiality but teach truthfully the way of God. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But detecting the craftiness, he said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? Caesar's, they said. Well then, he told them, Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. They were not able to catch him in what he said in public. And being amazed at his answer, they became silent. Having been embarrassed once again by Jesus, the leaders step back. And so they hired spies to do their dirty work. Now the spies appeared innocent and pure, but their purpose was anything but that. They wanted to twist Jesus' word so that the Roman government would sentence him to death. Surely Roman authority could deal with the authority of a lone individual such as Jesus. They used a two-kingdom question to bring Roman authority against Jesus' authority and to determine who ruled. Well, flattery provided their entry to Jesus. He didn't lie. He taught the truth. He ate with Pharisees and with sinners, showing no partiality to anyone. He taught, he taught the way of God and showed people how to walk in God's will. So again, with ironic flattery, these spies acted like they had spied on Jesus and could describe him accurately. They didn't mean to give an accurate description, but they did so, thus investing investing him with an authority they could not claim, the authority of truth. So having politely set up, set Jesus up, they asked an innocent question. Was it legal for a Jewish citizen to pay taxes to a pagan Roman government? Now, they had set Jesus up with an either-or, yes or no answer. As with the either-or problem he posed in verse 4, neither answer was safe. To say the law of Moses permitted taxes to Rome would, be, would alienate heavily taxed people who saw Rome as an intrusive enemy. To say the law of Moses forbade taxes to Romans would be committing treason in the eyes of the Roman government and to face the death penalty. Jesus, however, couldn't be fooled. He detected their craftiness. In verse 24, he turned the question back on them. Show me a denarii or denarius. The spies reached into their money bags and pulled out a silver, a silver denarius minted by the Roman government and used to pay the wages of a day's laborer. On it was an inscription saying, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. But here's the thing. By pulling out that coin, the Jewish, the Jewish spies implicated themselves and the leaders who sent them. Having a Roman coin meant that they were involved in Roman commerce and business. They had thus, to some degree, capitulated to the enemy. Still, though, they gladly showed him the coin. Now, they thought, 
he had to answer? Well, no, not yet. Other than the description, there was something else he wanted them to see. Look at the coin, Jesus told them. Whose image does it have? His point being this. Who has the right to determine what is written on the coin? It wasn't a complicated question. So they simply answered, Caesar's. Well, the simple answer was met with a simple statement that answered their original question, their own question. Give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. In other words, let Caesar have coins. God's image, image is on people. God's image is on you. Let people be devoted to God. This would include all people. For Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Certainly, people are more important to God than things and coins than the Roman government. So by saying this, the Lord was, playing, was, was placing devotion to God on a higher plane than devotion to Caesar without in, indicting himself as opposed to God or to government. Well, after saying this, they weren't able to catch him in what he said in, in what he said in public. The leaders realized that Jesus couldn't be couldn't be trapped, and it amazed them all. Jesus again dream, demonstrated his wisdom, power, and authority when those when those spies became silent. When Jesus was trapping the trappers. But not only that, Jesus' statement also demonstrates that all the facts of life have reference to God, including the need to submit to governmental rule. In the end, their efforts to catch, to catch Jesus in a self-condemning statement had failed. But nevertheless, when we get to chapter 23, we're going to see how they took this perfect answer and then twisted it. There they accused Jesus of forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar when he actually said the opposite. Here's the thing here with this part of the passage. It's unfortunate that some Christians have mistaken the idea that the more obnoxious they are as citizens, the more they please God and witness for Christ. Sure, yes, we must never violate our conscience. We must never go against what the Word of God says. We must do what is morally right, what is ethically right. But we should seek to be peacemakers and not troublemakers. And if you want a good example of what this looks like, and I won't get into the full story because it would take me a long, uh, a long time. But just look at the Old Testament book of Daniel. Read what he did when they took him away as a slave. When the Babylonians took him away as a slave and, and they were making him do things that he didn't want to do. And see how he obeyed. And see how he was still faithful to the Lord. So if you're confused with all this stuff going on and you're wondering, okay, how do I respond? How do I, you know, there's so many stories in the Old Testament and New Testament that will show you a proper way to deal with it, how God blessed people who, who again, dealt with these difficult situations in the right way. They were peacemakers and not troublemakers. Jesus Christ was watched and tested by his enemies during that final week. And yet in spite of what they saw and learned, they rejected him. But here's the thing. Jesus was also examining them. 
For as they questioned him, he questioned them. And their responses revealed their ignorance, hatred, and unbelief of their hearts. As I close, I want to quickly go back to something Jesus said in verse 18. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will shatter him. The one who falls on Jesus, the cornerstone, will indeed be, indeed be broken. For it's only in admitting our sin and our need that we can be saved. You see, those who aren't broken before him will one day be broken by him. Every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The only question is, when will this happen? Will you do it now in brokenness before him and be saved? Or will you wait too long and be broken by him? I think there's many people out there that have been broken by him. I've been broken by him, and it's not a good feeling. Looking back now, I, I wish I had chosen just to come to him with a heart, with a broken heart, and to ask for forgiveness. But regardless of where you're at, if you're watching, listening, and, and you're at that place where you're broken, or God has broken you, that's the perfect place for you to be, for him to save you. Being broken just means that he will put you back together. There's no better hands that know how to put the pieces of a shattered heart of a shattered soul of a shattered you know, just person than the hands of God Almighty who created this universe. So if you want to be saved, if you want to be born again, if you want to become a believer and you now want to be saved, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head wherever you're at and pray this with all sincerity, with all your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm a sinner. And I ask you for your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins and that you rose from the dead. So now, Lord, today, I turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you're out there and you prayed that, we want to hear from you. We want to help you in your next steps, in your new Christian, born-again Christian life. We want to celebrate with you. We want to just tell you and, and encourage you and maybe lead. If you're out of state or not from the area, we want to help you find a, a good Bible teaching church in, uh, in, around your location. If you're here in El Paso, of course, we welcome you here to Fresh Vision Church. Um, uh, we're definitely, we'll definitely be blessed by your presence, by you being here. We also just want to continue to bless you. So if you want information, again, go to our website. We're at 4242 Hondo Pass Drive, right in the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway, Suite 101. But again, you can also contact us through email, or you can call us, and we'll get a hold of you and... And we've got extra Bibles here we can give you, and, you know, we can, we want to help you. So definitely reach out to us.
again, we're not done with this chapter, and there's still going to be more confrontations, more conflict. There's still going to be more questions. They're going to question, continue to question Jesus. But here again, we just see a glimpse of some of the issues that these religious leaders had with the Lord and how he just was so smart, so wise, so intelligent. She knew what they were up to. Trapping the trappers. He knew what to do. Let's close one more time in prayer. Lord, thank you for this morning here. Thank you for everyone that made it and were, were, are here. Lord, I hope that they were blessed by this message. I hope that they will go home and and continue to reflect, maybe read this passage one more, once more, and that you will speak new truths to them. May we have humble hearts. May we have loving hearts. May we have joyful hearts as we share your message or remind us not to not to share these mess this message by wanting to win an argument or wanting to be right or out of pride or out of selfishness lord but just out of love for you to be a witness to testify of how great you are i pray that you will bless everyone's upcoming week i pray for those that weren't able to make it today i pray that they will um you will continue to keep them safe for those who are traveling. I pray that you will also protect them wherever they uh, may be at. We look forward to the day that we can, all of us are able to, to gather again as a, as a church family. It's going to be a glorious day, Lord. An amazing, beautiful day. So, Lord, bring healing to this land. Pray for healing from COVID, that, and we pray for just healing in general, the, the pain and the hurt that's division that's going on in this country. Lord, we need you. We need to hear from you, Lord. Speak powerfully during this time. We thank you for being so good and so loving. And thank you for Jesus, for saving us. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.